in with a big magnet that got me in there. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about 30 minutes because it's Sunday morning and you got your family and all. And I want to take you into, I'm going to give you the hors d'oeuvre. But this is the whole meal. <laughs> is Stephen walking my spiritual journey that led me to death row. And I'm going to just be able to give you tidbits and little appetizers. And then in this second book, The Death of Innocence, it's about accompanying two people to execution that I believe were innocent, and you can make up your own mind about it because we have a very broken system. And But I'm going to take you there. You don't have to just take it on my word. And it also has in it in this book, my dialogue with Pope John Paul about the death penalty. So I'm going to just briefly take you into, and here's the journey, and it's Lent, and we remember the suffering of Jesus for us. And when you think about it, what killed Jesus? And we want to make sure we don't quickly put a theology on it and say, well, he had to die to save us from, from our sins. There's Factors that killed Jesus. Just like when you look, what killed Martin Luther King? What killed Archbishop Romero? What killed the six Jesuit priests at the, the university in El Salvador that was speaking out for justice and against what was happening to the people? There are factors that happen, and it has a lot to do with who we're involved with, whose side we stand by, who are the ones without any voice that we go and stand with begin to struggle for justice. My story, just like your story, baptized, St. Agnes, Catholic Church, Catholic family, Lady of Mercy Church, uh, and the gospel, Jesus awakens us. The best thing I can say, it's like we keep being awakened. I just discovered it uh, in this psalm the other last week in the, in the liturgy, Psalm 81. Unseen, I answered you in thunder. There are some things that happen where there's bursting this awareness, deep awareness, and it, it changes the trajectory of our life. And that's what happened to me. And so Catholic nun, New Orleans, taught seventh and eighth grade, then taught high school, then was the DRE in the parish. And just my little boat on the way, just when the current moved, just trying to follow, find God's will in my life, just try to imitate Christ, try to be another Christ in the world. But the first big burst, a breakthrough, and this was when I was in my 40s. I mean, God wakes us up when it's time. <laughs> and you know what I figured out? It doesn't matter when we wake up, it's what we do after we wake up that's really important. And I got it that the gospel of Jesus was more than about being pious and prayerful and meditating and being nice to the people around me, which is all good. That charity, the gospel of Jesus is far more radical than just being nice to people around us. Even at times, certain times of the year, being generous toward poor people. It is that, but it's much more. And I awakened to that. And that's the first part of the story of Dead Man Walk. And I grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. My father was a successful lawyer. Good Catholic family, Baton Rouge. Uh, it was during the days when African American people couldn't even sit with us in church, had to drink from separate water fountains, and culture blinded me. It was like, well, that's just the way we do things here. Better for the race to stay separate because when we get together, you need to fight. Never question it. Culture is all around us. We're like little goldfish swimming in the bowl. And it's all our culture. This is the way we do things. This is how we're tough on crime in Georgia. Those people who do those murders, they deserve to die. And we give all our reasons, and the Supreme Court upholds it, makes it legal. Culture. 
And this is what we're really going to do for the victim's family. If they've lost a loved one, doesn't justice demand that the one who took their life gives up their life? And they get to send a representative to Wives, as the state of Georgia kills the one who killed their loved one. And look at their crime. Look at what they did. They deserved it. In fact, anything less than death, what they did to their victim, is, is not worthy of the victim's family. Justice demands. They kill, so they die. And we offer that the victim's family will be healed, or will be get closure, or get justice, by the death of the person. George is a big executing state, as is my state, Louisiana. Isn't this interesting? There's a pattern that the death penalty follows. The Supreme Court said in 1976, when they put the death penalty back, that it's only to be reserved for the worst of the worst murders. Isn't it interesting, though, that 78%, almost 80% of all the executions of the actual practitioners of the death penalty are the 10 southern states that practice slavery? And it's, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna learn everything. I don't know boo scat when I start getting involved in all this. I'm talking <laughs> grammar to seventh and eighth grade boys. I mean, I was dealing with semicolons and commas and trying to get them not to be sprinkling in their punctuation like salt and pepper on their scrambled eggs. <laughs> because we inhabit the world we're in, whatever that world is. But that waking up, that the gospel of Jesus was about being on this side of four people. And I moved into the St. Thomas Housing Projects in New Orleans. I lived in the suburbs my whole life and always worked with good people. Everybody we work with deserves our love. They deserve our service. But I was so unaware that there was this whole other life going on in the inner city of New Orleans. I found out when I did research for Dead Man Walker, there were more complaints to the Justice Department about police brutality in New Orleans than any other city. And that could have been in Calcutta, as far as I was concerned. I wasn't scared of police. If my car broke down on the road at, at, at night and the state trooper had pulled up, I'd say, thank God, help's on the way. So when I moved into the St. Thomas Housing Project, African-American people became my teachers. Very interesting, if you read the story, there's a great book called Untying the Knots, of the story of Jorge Bergoglio, the man who is now our Pope Francis. He started out a lot like I did, on the other side of things, and, and, and not knowing about what, what was happening with poor people. And he was very much in, you gotta keep the teachings of the church, and, and he himself talks about himself when he was made a, a provincial superior to Jesuits in Buenos Aires. And he was very authoritarian. I'm the one who said, this is what goes. And then that breaking open, that happened to Pope Francis. Great story. Because then he moved in the slums of Buenos Aires and lived among the people and took the bus and was in the homes of the people and saw what the people were experiencing in World War. I'm still grateful to be awake. And all we do when we're awake, we just start acting. And, and I think of it like a wave. I think of it like a current. We get caught in different currents. And or we choose to put our boat on a certain current. But it gets, there's always a gift in it, because I didn't wake on myself up. But then I go to St. Thomas. While I'm there at St. Thomas, one day coming out of the Adult Learning Center, in the first pages of this book, I see somebody who works in the Prison Coalition office. And we are the highest incarcerated in the world in the United States, 2.3 million people. And Louisiana is the highest incarcerator of all the states incarcerated. In Europe, they to wherever you have poverty, where, wherever you have this history of racism, you can have high, high incarceration rates in the state. And so I see somebody coming from the prison coalition office, and he says, hey, Sister Helen, you want to be a pen pal? 
There's somebody on death row. I said, yeah, sure. I want to talk about Jesus is sneaky. Jesus is sneaky, and this is Jesus sneaky part one. Because <laughs> he had a clipboard that day, and everybody he met, this is the way grace happens in my life, and he happened to see me. And he says, hey, Sister Helen, uh, I'm signing up people here. You want to be a pen pal with somebody on death row? I thought, sure, I could do that. I was an English major. I could write some nice letters. <laughs> Maybe send a guy a poem, you know. And I don't know that two years, a little over two years after I write that letter, the man I write the letter to, Pat Sonia, the first story in this book, is going to be electrocuted to death in the state of Louisiana. And that at quarter to six in the evening, because the execution is going to happen at midnight, everybody has to leave that death house except the spiritual God. Who's going to be me? And that I will be with him. And I will witness his death. And it's going to change my life. Conversion or the turning in our lives happens. We do, we take action in that ourselves. We have agency. We, it's Lent. We undertake spiritual practice so that we can deepen our understanding and our reflection. Always with the question, Lord, what do you want me to do? What is your will for me? And, and that's the trajectory. I'm there, and I want to hold up as an image because the cross was meditating on and, and the journey of the cross and suffering and redemption and limp. Is there two arms on this cross? And the gospel of Jesus is always going to take us onto both sides of the arms of the cross, never onto one. On one arm of the cross is the perpetrator that has done this unspeakable crime guilty or maybe not but mostly where we have to face the hard moral crunch and tim robbins did this in the movie at dead man walking he said we're not going to have an innocent person it's to be a guilty person because the crunch about the death penalty is look what he did can't we kill him he deserves to die so on one arm of the cross is the perpetrator on the other arm of the cross are the victims And Jesus is in the middle, and the gospel stretches us to be on both sides, to be with the victims, whoever the victims are. And our culture polarizes us. If you're really for that victim's family, you care about them, then you're going to want to see the death penalty. And if you decide on any punishment less than death, then you're dishonoring that victim's family. What does Jesus call us to do? In reconciliation, where you bring opposites together and say, I'm not going to take one side over against the other. It's a spiritual journey. And we live in a culture that has a long, long history of solving our social problems through violence. Long history. The death penalty is still epitomizes that because we're, we're the only western industrialized country in the world that still kills our citizens. The 194 nations in the world, the vast majority of them have put the death penalty behind them because it sanctions or legalizes or even uh, legitimizes that the state can kill when you have a good reason you can kill somebody. And then we come now to of John Paul. In this book, I talk about accompanying two people who were innocent. One of them was Joseph Odell in Virginia. I had no idea how broken the system was and the difference it makes if you're poor and you don't have money for resources to get a really good lawyer who knows how to access your constitutional protections, which every citizen is promised, especially the one brought up against the full powers of the state, free life. Now, we're supposed to have 
an attorney by our side who's supposed to be competent. That's the theory. But poor people, and the reason you will never see a rich person on death row, it's not that sometimes rich people don't do unspeakable crimes, but they know where to get that Cracker Jack attorney that's going to be able to access all their protections for them and fight that DA and that prosecutor every step of the way against that death penalty. And the prosecutor is not stupid. The prosecutor knows if I have somebody that has this kind of lawyer, I can go public, I'm going to go for the death penalty, and I might not win. Because they're going to do pre-trial motions, they're going to object constantly during the trial and put that into the appeals. Where over here I have somebody who's poor, they don't have money for defense. We appoint them a lawyer who often is overworked and underpaid. And Georgia fits the classic scheme of the death penalty, as does my state, Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama and the southern states. And so you're not up against a fierce defense. They don't have resources to get expert witnesses. They're not going to get the DNA tested. And it's an uneven playing field from the beginning. But what they keep holding up is, look what he did. Look what he did. Look at his terrible crime. So I'm going to learn about that. And in the process with this man, Joseph Adele, he, he went through the whole court process. And they never once had a full evidentiary hearing on all the evidence, the forensic evidence, about supposedly his killing this woman, Helen Sharp. They never had it. Because his lawyer that was appointed to him, he found out the lawyer was in cahoots with the DA and was telling the DA everything. So he just said, I'm going pro se. Now that is very dangerous. Pro se means I'm going to defend myself and try. But he didn't trust the lawyer appointed. And he, so he doesn't know the law. He doesn't know how to cross-examine witnesses. He doesn't know. And slam dunk, he goes to trial, found guilty, sentenced to death in Virginia. Virginia is one of the